There's a reason why Team Fortress 2 doesn't receive any community updates anymore, despite the large amount of amazing content that its community creates every single day. And that's because there's been events in TF2's history that made the game's developers excited to create updates with the community, to downright cutting vital parts of an update due to their own high expectations, and poor management leading to a load of community drama, leaving us with years of rumors and misinformation being passed around. But to understand why so much controversy around community updates even exist, we need to talk about hats. At the start of Team Fortress 2, hats didn't exist, but it would only only take little over a year until the revolutionary Sniper vs Spy update came into place, giving every single class a cosmetic, which meant finally letting Heavy cover his bald spot. The reason Valve did this was because they wanted to allow players to collect items that wouldn't affect gameplay, while also letting players distinguish one from another. Unbeknownst to Valve, this caused some players to start creating hats for the game immediately, forming a community on a small thread on the Facepunch forums with the purpose of showcasing community-made hats, which at the time had no monetary incentive, but rather just a pure passion of being able to create and mod it into the game, while fantasizing that maybe one day Valve would put it into the game. Over time, this thread would go through a few name changes, as what had started as a small group of people posting their hats grew into something much larger, finally solidifying itself as a TF2 Emporium, and their size would not go unnoticed, because along the line, the owner of the thread, Daymao, was contacted by Valve, and they wanted to buy their hats. Fast forwarding to January 13th, 2010, Valve announced that the community could start submitting their own creations through a contribution page. Although would go on to be replaced by the Steam Workshop, this feature not only led to an influx of creators working to getting their hats in the three community contribution updates that would happen over the next year and a half, but some workshoppers would also take it upon themselves to organize their own projects, working together to create fake TF2 updates consisting of several hats, maps, or weapons, such as the Night of the Living update, which produced over 90 cosmetics and 10 Halloween-themed maps, the Fancy vs. Nasty update with several hats and weapons you may recognize, or the Medieval update a few months after the release of the medieval game mode, bringing cosmetics and weapons that fit into the theme. While these were only community-made projects, they started to catch Valve's attention, being shouted out on the official blog if players wanted to download and replace their in-game hats with what was made. But it wouldn't take too long for Valve to add them into the game anyway, as they were pretty hooked onto what the community was making. And soon enough, these fake community-made updates wouldn't be so fake anymore. In the late year of 2012, the TF2 community was unknowingly going to accomplish something amazing together. With the Man vs. Machine game mode being released a few months prior, a few workshoppers had already begun to create robo-themed hats, and two of those workshoppers belonging to the TF2 Emporium would take the time to recreate two regular cosmetics into a robotic fashion, before one of them realized they could push this into another opportunity for players to participate in creating a fake TF2 update. On December 30th, a new post was made to the TF2 Emporium. Players had until January 10th to participate in creating a robo-themed hat for the newest fake TF2 update, as well as partnering with TF2Maps.net to announce a robo -themed theme for their next major mapping contest. Within the next month, a promotional SFM was storyboarded, animated, and put onto a new webpage to tease the fake update's release. But then, they got an email from Valve. And so we have this email from Valve, which is written in the voice of a robot. Yeah, Basically, the whole nice. first few emails was one long roleplay. It's like, Dear Robot Scout, great job on your landing page and starring in your own TF2 SFM short. Being the robot artist who made the first set of robo hats, it nearly brings a tear bolt to my lens to see you take on such a monumental Task. One of our robot programmers here picked your site up on his radar and relayed it to the rest of the team. How far along are you in your mission to robotize hats? The original members of the robotic boogaloo team were given the go-ahead to flesh things out into an official update, and they did not take this for granted. A blog post was made, the team grew larger, and for the next three months they would work on the update. And on May 17th, 2013, Robotic Boogaloo became the first community project to turn into an official update in Team Fortress 2. 57 cosmetics, a comic, a refurbished SFM, as well as several art pieces on an official landing page was made entirely by the community, making $250,000 within a week. The split of the money was also an issue, as the robotic boogaloo team wanted to give a portion of money to their website and SFM creator, which Valve did not account for. And instead of Valve's proposed idea to have them written down as a contributor of every single hat released in the update, essentially giving them an extremely large cut for each hat that sold on the Manco store, they worked out a deal where they could earn a percentage of a unique key sale, giving control to the founder of the project on what percentage each member would take. Which while it was a decent solution at the time, it was a risky responsibility for Valve to give project leaders that would spark a major issue in a future community update. Following the successful release of the Robotic Boogaloo update, Valve was interviewed by a well-known TF2 podcast named Critzcast, in which Valve mentioned how they wanted to see more fleshed out ideas such as Robotic Boogaloo, because it was at this point, founder and CEO of Valve, Gabe Newell, realized something very important. 10 times as much content comes from the user base for TF2 
to as comes from us. So we think that we're super productive and kind of badass at making TF2 content. But even at this early stage, we cannot compete. We'll go up against Bungie or Blizzard or anybody, but we won't try to compete with our own user base because we already know uh, that we're gonna lose. The first two weeks that we did this, we actually broke PayPal. I don't know what they're worried about, maybe drug dealing. They're like, nothing generates cash to our user base other than selling drugs. So we actually had to work something out with them and said, no, they're making hats, not. <laughs> uh, but unbeknownst to them, it would cost the health and time of some of TF2's most passionate individuals. Players were excited to participate in more community projects in the hope that they would become official. But the next project wouldn't start from a public blog post, but rather an extremely talented SFM animator. This is McVee, being one of the first players to ever play on a TF2 server, eventually gaining a passion in animating after the release of Valve's Day of Defeat trailer, and would come to animate famous pieces such as Practical Problems and other projects to showcase what was possible within the limits of the Source Engine built within SFM. At some point, however, McVee's health was in danger. He was battling cancer, and while bedridden, he started to work on a new project to practice his storytelling, animation, the urge to crash a train, and most noticeably, pushing the limits of what was possible using Source Filmmaker. And on August 28th, 2013, he released the End of the Line trailer. Filled with action, animation, and a medic voiced by Markiplier, I'm not kidding, it says it in the description, the trailer gained traction fast within the community, and since Valve was actually paying attention to the community around this time, they saw it too. Once in a while, I really hear people uh, or the animators hear like, how did they do that? <laughs> like in yeah. end of line, end of line, you saw yeah. the preview of them, yeah. and there's a medic with his um, with his code and the code. Is yeah. <laughs> how is he yeah, doing like, that? A week after the release of the trailer, McVee was invited to Valve headquarters and was told to bring what he had gotten done so far. He opened his laptop, and slowly, around 30 staff members gathered around to watch his unfinished animation. He was told he should apply to Valve, and while McVee didn't do so because he was tired of working for AAA companies, he did agree to one of the things that was proposed to him. Robin Walker, one of the founding creators of the Team Fortress series spoke to him with the idea of turning what he had made into something official. For the next few months, the spontaneous passion project grew into something much larger, as he would not only need to finish his animation, but now he was tasked to create an update for one of the top games on the Steam platform. And to do this, he had to sacrifice a lot. McVee ended up quitting a $70,000 job in order to work on the SFM, and along the way would go $40,000 in debt, having to abandon his cancer treatment, all while spending around 13 hours a day working on the film, and would often be told to take breaks by the character animator on the team, as McVee started to pull all-nighters, enough to once land him in the hospital. And because McVee wanted to create more than just an update with cosmetics and an SFM, he would also take the time to playtest a new map, CP Snowplow, that the mappers on the team were constantly looking for feedback on because Valve refused to add it into the beta testing map pool that already featured RD Asteroid, which I've made a video on, and Payload Cactus Canyon. At the end of everything, the team had a full 14-minute cinematic SFM, an entire map, two taunts and a load of cosmetics that were seen in the film, and three new weapons with unique stats. The team knew that the majority of players wanted non-cosmetic features in the update, and they worked hard to provide that. And after months of work, the community's expectations were at an all-time high. The team sent Valve everything they had made, and then on December 8, 2014, the update was released alongside the SFM that McVee had spent over a year making and Valve scrapped more than half of the update. Snowplow wasn't added, and the creators of the map were disappointed to have been told by Valve that the map was too confusing and challenging for new players. Coming from the same people who've added Hydro, Junction, and would come to release Map Harbor just two weeks later, both taunts also didn't get added to the game. Certain cosmetics despite being in the SFM were not added, and almost like a spit in the face, one of the weapons submitted for the end of the line were instead added in an update earlier within the year, while the other two weapons were scrapped due to not passing Valve's quality filter. Not only were players angry that the update only brought cosmetics into the game after being told by the end of the line team that non-cosmetic items would be their main focus, giving the team backlash for something they couldn't control, but Valve also added their own item that players had to pay for, which had no other purpose than to track points gained during the temporary event and essentially act as a noisemaker, which given how Valve only shares 12.5% of every key sale, the Dog Journal was the end of the line team's last bet at making sure they were paid well. It was a major disappointment to see what the end of the line update could have been, but little did players know that the next community 
Committee update was already being worked on in secret, but it too would start one of TF2's biggest dramas with leaks and arguments, which could be one of the reasons why TF2's developers haven't bothered to let the community take control of community updates. The Alien Invasion update is probably one of the most controversial updates to ever release due to how much leaks, drama, and misinformation that stemmed from it. And this story all started in early 2014 by a user with the name The Ronin. He had already contributed multiple items and cosmetics into the game, and his next big step would be to create a community update for TF2. To do this, he would form what he would call the Blue Book Team, inviting his first member and co-leader Bang, who held many important connections within the TF2 community, in order to slowly build up the Alien Invasion Team, allowing them to partner with TF2Maps.net to start the Mercs vs. Alien Mapping Contest, in which Ronin and Bang contributed a total of $1,000 to spread across the three winners, and then the very next day Blue Book member Void ran the Cosmetic Conquest Contest as well as the 72-hour Alien-themed Mapping Contest, putting up a price sum of $210 for the Hack Contest and a price selection of Steam Games for the Mapping Contest. TF2 cosmetic creators worked away on creating Alien-themed cosmetics with the plan of flooding the workshop on a certain day, and TF2 mappers went to making their Alien-themed maps. The three-day Mapping Contest passed by and were judged accordingly, but it wasn't over as they were allowed to continue tinkering with their map to submit it into the Mercs vs. Aliens competition. And finally, on January 9th of 2015, the Mercs vs. Aliens mapping contest results finally came in, with a three-way tie that had to be rescored. Some of the maps got advice by playtesters and judges, but what nobody expected was that just three weeks later, Valve emailed feedback for every map entry in the competition. And like they said in an interview after the robotic boogaloo update, they loved the idea of the community creating fleshed out ideas for future updates. This was a rare opportunity for everyone to have something they made added to the game, so many of them worked away, but eventually, things started to crumble from the inside. Five months later, an SFM that was sent to Valve had leaked. Next month, Critscast released a Meet Your Makers page, but it was filled with cryptic messages. The community caught on fast. The hype was building up. Early September brought posters into the game, teasing the upcoming update, but within the same month, major leaks came out from within the Alien Invasion team, spoiling all the contents of the update. But that was only just the beginning. Two weeks before the release of the update, the leaders of the projects who controlled the revenue shares released the information on how much each person would receive from the sale of what was presumably the $15 Alien Invasion Pass. Given the contrast of how much the project leaders were getting paid versus everyone else, a good amount of individuals were unhappy. Perhaps they felt it was disingenuous of them to reveal this information so close to the release of the update. Negotiations were attempted, but were slow due to the fact that many creators were working real jobs or attended school, and people were quite literally told by the project leaders that their work would not get put into the game, but they didn't agree with them taking most of the revenue. This made a good portion of the Alien Invasion team quite frustrated, which led to a leak in revenue shares, but also meant that some of them got into contact with Valve, and Valve emailed every single contributor to the Alien Invasion update, discussing the terms of how everyone was going to be paid out, finalizing the terms of how much each part of the Alien Invasion team would receive, and ultimately putting that argument to rest. The drama wasn't over yet, the update was delayed. The leakers who had pent up anger blamed Bang for not finishing the website, while Bang made a public statement explaining that Valve was the one who delayed the update in order to finish coding something for a map. None of the people I've spoken to truly know why the update was delayed, but it didn't matter since only four days later on October 6, 2015, the update released. New maps, reskins, cosmetics, a taunt, and SFM, and an invasion pass that would add the invasion crates to your drop pool. It was the best community update that had ever been released despite the circumstances. However, Valve did end up changing the way they wanted to pursue future community updates in order to not have another situation where a project leader could attempt to gatekeep what got into the update, but this did come with a price. They announced that from then on they would be announcing the themes, but the community was free to bounce ideas around. Near the end of 2017, Valve announced a jungle theme, which apparently was a coincidence with the timing and how it occurred months later after the community created the Mayan project, which essentially was jungle themed. And then the devs went on to include all the jungle themed cosmetics into the jungle inferno update. Since then, there has never been a community update in TF2, leaving missed opportunities to adopt and implement some of TF2's greatest work. It should be obvious that I do not condone anyone to go out of their way to harass anyone involved in these community updates, as it's not their fault that Valve doesn't continue community updates utilizing their new method. Instead, let's give the community a little more credit for what they've been able to accomplish. Like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, this one took a while to make, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.